on Sunday nights in our church, I'll be up there speaking, and uh, those very mean uh, youth workers are downstairs making popcorn. Oh, and you can smell it coming up through the baptistry right behind me, and it's like, <laughs> wow, is that tough. This morning? Yeah. Yeah, there it is. That's tough, too. Okay. Go with me to Philippians 3. Verse number two, second command. Second command. All right, first command is in verse one. It is keep on being joyful. Good. Second command we're going to look at today. Keep on being wary. The next two are in verse 17. What is number three? Keep on becoming. And the fourth one? Keep on beholding. Very nice. Very nice. I hope you're enjoying uh, your own personal time in the book of Philippians as well. I do highly encourage you to spend time in it. It has been an incredible blessing to me. Honestly, for years and years, I've wanted just to dig into this passage in all its depth. And, and uh, I've always had other avenues I'm going with Sunday morning and, and such at the church. And uh, I've gone through Philippians once before with them. But it's like, I want to go back. <laughs> I want to spend more time in this book. It's such a rich book, and it's a great book. But here we're going to talk about keep on bewaring today. And honestly, when I read through chapter 3, for many years I, I've gone through this chapter, and I thought this thought, and this is just what it was. Paul, this could have been a perfect chapter, except for verse number 2. Why do you have that in there? That's not what you hang on your wall, right? I mean, you could go to Galatians 5, 23, 22, 22 and 23, have the fruit of the spirits up there. Nobody puts 17, 18, and 19 on their wall. But they put these verses. And much of Philippians 3, they're rich verses, wonderful verses. And I said, why verse number 2? It seems a little bizarre, a little out of the place. Beware of the dogs. You see it with me. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. Okay. What do we do with that? Beware of the dogs. You know, in the 21st century, we think German shepherds. We think uh, golden retrievers and maybe poodles. Uh, if you go and dig into the old English of William Tyndale back in the 1500, at least the way he spelled it, it looks like this. Beware of the doggies. I mean, they had funny spelling back then. And I said, beware the doggies. I, I picture a room full of all these little puppies. They're rolling around and all, they're all over the place and falling over each other and gives you ample room to trip on them yourself. And I said, yeah, we need to beware of those. Uh, I didn't know what that would be. Except if you don't like dogs, this might be your life verse. I don't know. But here in this context of Philippians 3, it's going to be easier for us now that we've already spent some time working on his mentality and his appeal that we have more Christ, more Christ, that this verse is going to suddenly stand up and say, wow, is this important? Because even the commentaries, and I've seen this because those who want to form the whole chapter, the whole book, just on the idea of rejoice, 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 they don't know exactly what to do with this. And they say, well, Paul must have diverted his attention onto something that happened. Maybe as he's writing, dogs ran through the room or something like that. I don't know what it was. But uh, suddenly he had a, a, another thought. And then he had to swing it back around to rejoice again by verse number four or something like that. And so they're, they're, they're trying to find out, what do you do with this verse? But I'm going to show you that it has perfect logic in what Paul is saying. And why it's in here is very important because there are dangers to the mentality, more Christ. More Christ. We want to know more of Him. We want to know Him. We want to be found in Him. We want to, as he said in chapter 1, for me to live is Christ and to die, more Christ, gain. And yet there are some things that can easily divert us from that. Let me start with a little bit of history here. And it's several pages of my notes to tell the truth, so I'm going to give you the verse reference. And it's not that I, I say, don't turn there. You can turn there, okay? But 
for lack of time, I mean, if I had the rest of the year, that's good. But uh, here we go. Um, when Paul started his first missionary journey, we talked a little bit about that already today, uh, he traveled up to Pisidia, Antioch, in Asia Minor territory, somewhere in the Galatian territory there. He's with Paul, uh, Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas go up there. They go into a town called Perga. They go to Pisidian Antioch. They go on the Sabbath day into the synagogue. They sat down there, and Paul began to preach. And in Acts chapter 13, verse 42, there starts with a very good response to his sermon. All right? It says, and when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. And when the congregation was broken up, it says in verse 43, chapter 13, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas. That's really great. Uh, and they were speaking to them and persuading them to continue in the grace of God. Opposition starts to break out. In chapter 13, you only travel one more verse down in verse 44. And the next Sabbath day, it says, The whole city came together to hear the word of God. And when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. And they spoke against these things which were spoken by Paul. And they were con uh, contradicting him. And they were blaspheming. By the time you get to verse 50, more trouble. The Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecutions against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. And they shook off the dust from their feet against them and they went into Iconium. Iconium should be great, right? So they go into Iconium. Chapter 14 begins, verse 1. They came to Iconium. They were both together in the synagogue of the Jews. They spoke a great multitude both of the Jews and the Greeks believed. Wonderful news. Verse 2. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. In other words, they embittered them, is the words. They embittered them against the brethren. Paul heads off to Lystra. Chapter 14, verse 19. They came thither, uh, certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and they stoned Paul. They threw him out of the city. They thought he had died. They left him there, and they walked back into town. If they had only looked back, guess who followed them? The apostle Paul got up and went right back into town. Isn't that exciting? I always say, Paul, what are you doing? They just stoned you. He says, that's okay. He got up, he went back in. This is tough ministry stuff, isn't it? This group was following him wherever he went. They made their way back to Jerusalem. Eventually, the great council of Acts 15 took place. Paul starts his second missionary journey with Silas. They go back to Lystra and Derby. And that's interesting. They pick up men like Timothy along the way to go with them. They're called to Macedonia. I'm giving you the whole book of Acts in a couple of sentences. Uh, they entered into Philippi. We've been talking a little bit about that in Acts 16 already. They go into Acts 17. They're in a place called Thessalonica. That's all in the Macedonian region. And what did Paul encounter there? Acts 17, verse 5. The Jews which believed not were moved to envy, took into them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. That means bad guys. All right? And they gathered a company and they set the city on an uproar. They they started all kinds of riots. They assaulted the house of Jason. They sought to bring the people, uh, bring them out to the people. It was a bad scene. It was a very bad scene. So Paul took off to Berea. Now, he's not running for his life, okay? The Lord's leading him through this. Uh, a beautiful church came out of Thessalonica, even with only one week of real good ministry there. It's amazing what the Lord did. But Paul goes into Berea, and in Acts 17, 13, guess what? When the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God uh, was preached to Paul at Berea, they came also and stirred up the people. So move on to Paul's third journey. Many years have gone by. Paul's heading toward Jerusalem. Uh, he stops at a harbor on the way at the end of his journey. He goes to speak to the Ephesian believers. And in Acts chapter 20, these are the words that go with this. 
verse 18, And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears, with trials, which came upon me through the plot of the Jews. Be on guard, he says in verse 28, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, if you have the King James, you have grievous wolves. That sounds terrible. Savage is the term here too. Savage wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock and from among your own selves men will arise speaking perverse things and draw away the disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by a space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. This has been Paul's theme for a long time. A long time. So, these words are spoken and just a few years later, Paul's in a prison writing to the Philippians. Guess what's on his heart still? The false teachers. They followed him everywhere. Do you think they made it to Philippi? Oh, yes, they did. That matter of fact, we see it. Here's the thing. Paul is now limited in a place. He can't just go out and, and deal with this. He's there. The, the, the false teachers have the freedom. These who cause trouble in the church and from the outside and from the inside, they have the freedom to still roam about to cause their damage. And Paul's like, I can't, I can't be there. I can't be there. When we first bought a house in Birmingham, Alabama, um, needed a little bit of fixing up, but one of the things particular about this house was that every single window had iron bars on them. They were decorative, okay, so that looked good. But we always ask the question, are we locked in or are they locked out? <laughs> we're not sure. Were we in the cage or were they? It was just an interesting question. Here Paul says, okay, I, I'm limited. I'm limited. The false teacher is not. He's a concern of mine. In chapter 1 of Philippians, verse 15, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention. They're not sincere. Supposing to add affliction to my bonds, they think, boy, we got Paul surrounded here, he can't get out. We're going to start this trouble, and we're going to make him really feel it. And they're preaching Christ. Isn't that incredible? Amazing to me. And then we also saw earlier, as we were going through, uh, chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand first fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. So you get to chapter 3, and he says, beware of the dogs. Is he out of context? Not at all. Not at all. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the circumcision. Let's, let's walk through this a little bit today uh, because it's a rather interesting thing to put this down. Matter of fact, I told you there are four commands, but of this command in chapter, or in verse number two, there are three times it says, beware, beware, beware. Uh, I use the word keep on bewaring because I like to follow the, the Greek flavor of the word and give it to you that way. Uh, Paul is still addressing the Philippians, the church. He's not talking to the dogs. He's talking to the church. Here's what I've noticed, and I appreciate, Frankie, what you said about this. You know, the, the, some of the issues we have in our country today is because of weak pulpits. Pastors who are not doing their job. We have weak churches that are not doing their job. Unfortunately, also, we have weak congregations. And you say, is that something the congregation should be concerned about? Absolutely. 
Why is it that we're more willing to make a pastor comfortable than to keep him uh, accountable? We do that too often. I'm sorry to say it. And being a pastor, I can blast myself all I want. <laughs> but that's a reality in our day. We sit there and smile while somebody up there is saying things contrary to God's word. Whose job is it to stand up and say, wait a minute, that's not what God's word says. But we don't want to be offensive, do we? That's our world telling us, just be quiet and let us lead you how we want. That's scary. There was a, quite a few years ago, we took the kids into a pet shop and, and we were looking for, I don't know, if it were birds or whatever it was we were looking in there for. But right in the middle of the pet shop, they had this giant aquarium with this ugly snake in it. Big, ugly snake. I wasn't about to buy that thing. But um, I'm looking in the, at that snake and it was just about lunchtime for the snake and they had dropped a couple of little white mice in there. And that snake just laid there while the mice ran around and around and around, not knowing what this place was. But every time they came around one side, they'd get on the tail of the snake and run all the way up the snake, over its head and down around again. And I said, oh, micey, if you only knew what you were running on. The mice didn't know, but they were totally oblivious to the fact that that snake was waiting its turn. When it was ready, the mice were done. Sometimes I wonder if that's what the church looks like. We're, we're, we're not cautious. We're not aware. We're not looking. We're not bewaring the danger that lurks, even inside the congregation, even in, from the pulpit. It's a scary thing to me. It concerns me a great deal, and I've spent many times thinking about this. I spent a whole year on preaching through the book of Jude to my congregation because we needed to be trained on how to spot false teachers, uh, especially in our day and age now. So Paul's addressing the Philippians. Notice the congregation. He's not just addressing the elders. He's talking to the whole, the body of Christ, the believers in Christ. He says, this is for all of you, all of you. Keep on bewaring. Again, I said, it's a word, beware. Uh, but I have to give it that present tense flavor of the, of the Greek imperative. Keep on bewaring. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. You know, whenever this command was first given, and no doubt Paul probably brought it up when he was there the first time, because he was good at warning people about the false teachers, because they were right behind him everywhere he went. And they heard that command many years before. And maybe they're thinking, well, Paul, you know, you said that 10 years ago. Aren't we done yet? We've been bewaring a long time, Paul. Can't, can't we stop? Can't we stop? The church has been around for almost 2,000 years. Have we had enough of the bewaring? Is it time to quit? Is it time to stop? Have we done our job after all these years? We got it all covered, right? Keep on be wary. That's a command that doesn't stop. It doesn't stop in any generation. We have to keep going. Beware, 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 beware. Keep on, keep on be wary. Because as long as there is a faithful church, there is an enemy of the church. He's there. And he wants nothing more than to mess up God's work. He started that way, you know, with the earth, and he started that way with Adam and Eve, and he even attempted to take out Christ. You think the church is, uh, is something he's going to say, oh, I won't mess with that. Oh, he's got the advantage in several places. Number one, if we're not good in the Word, and if we're not close to Christ, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. There's no need to persecute those who agree with you. The more the church that resembles the world, the less the enemy needs to hound them. If you say, boy, he's really attacking our, our church right now, maybe attacking here at the camp or something like that, praise the Lord for the fact he notices that you're a more like Christ. <laughs> because that's who he's going after. By simply saying, be more uh, like Christ, be Christ-like. More Christ, more Christ. Do you know what you're inviting? The enemy's attacks. Don't let that bother you. 
You say, well, it could bother me. Yeah? This is why the instruction is given to us. Keep on beware. Let's walk through it and then see its value. He says, literally, in this word, you keep on looking intently and contemplating the dogs, and you keep on looking intently and contemplating the evil workers, and you keep on looking intently and contemplating the circumcision. This is the squinty eye look. You ever use it? That's the squinty eye look. Boy, you're, you're lasered in on them. You're watching for them. You've got your eye out for them. We all know what a beware of the dog sign looks like. We've seen it before one way or the other. And when you see it, you just walk right in and say, no big deal, right? No, what's your first thing you do when you see beware of the dog? You go, where? And if it's way over there, and you're walking this way, how do you walk? You walk every step with your eyes that way. Why? You don't know when it's coming. But that's the look. That's the look he's talking about here. Don't take your eyes off of this one. Keep looking intently and contemplating these. Keep on, keep on, keep on. I love the way the Merriam-Webster, the online dictionary, puts this. It means to look at with careful and thoughtful attention, to think about deeply and carefully, and then I like this one, to have in mind a plan. So, ooh, that's pretty cool. That means you're not going into this just randomly, accidentally, but you've already thought through the strategy. You have a plan. Let me give it in a simple idea for you. Know them well and expect them always. Know them well and expect them always. Oh, but, but you just told us to keep rejoicing. This kind of messes up rejoicing, doesn't it? Say, so wait, wait a minute, I was told to rejoice last night and now I gotta keep watching for dogs? We gotta keep watching for those who are desirous to destroy that which we're rejoicing in. You know, sheep are very content when they're with their shepherd. When their shepherd calls them, they go out with him, they know his voice. You know that passage in John 10. They're very happy when the shepherd's around. And then some stranger shows up and starts to talk, and they don't follow him because they run away from him. They don't know the voice of a stranger. But here's one fact that's interesting. Uh, how do you keep your focus on the shepherd when you're surrounded by the enemy. Psalm 23 does speak to that effect, doesn't it? Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemy. It's kind of hard to eat when you get the wolves around you. That's distracting. That's distracting. But the sheep didn't need their focus on the wolves. They needed their focus on the shepherd. Guess who carried the rod and the staff? Guess who intentionally led them to that spot for lunch? Did the Lord know that the enemy was there? Yes. Did he know how close they would be? Yes. Does he know what they do to sheep? Yes. And what did he do? Did he chase them away? No. Well, why not? Shouldn't that be the best plan? I mean, Lord, just take the enemies away. Take the enemies away. Wouldn't that be great? But see, folks, even the enemies drive us closer to our shepherd. We want to get closer to the shepherd. And that's the whole picture here about more Christ, because if we keep our focus on Jesus, when the enemy comes along, we say, I've got to move closer. I've got to move closer. And that's a, that's a, a very important part of the picture of what Paul is doing here. In the act of be wearing, it means back up closer to your protection. Back up where you ought to be. Yes, you keep an eye on them, but your focus is on Jesus. We ought to know our enemies. We not, ought to know how they behave. We ought to know how they act. We ought to know how they speak. Much of 
Second Jude, I mean Second Jude, Second Peter, there's not a second Jude. <laughs> I'd be interested in knowing what Jude wanted to do with verse 3 there when he says, I had so many things to write to you about concerning our salvation. You know, that probably would have been a big book. <laughs> Instead he said, I've got a, something I've got to address. And he spent the rest of the time talking about false teachers. Second Timothy goes into a lot of detail about false teachers as well, in their behavior. We ought to know what they look like. We ought to know so we're not deceived by their appearances. They're dangerous. And the problem is they come disguised. They come disguised. When I was very early in my ministry, uh, just the first year or so of ministry, man, the Lord is so gracious, honestly. He should have zapped me with lightning the first day because I had no idea what I was doing. Thankfully, the church didn't either, so we lived in ignorance and we were so happy. <laughs> Five years of that was a mess, but I, I just thank the Lord. He was faithful to me all the way through. He was teaching me. I was, a, I was a rookie as a rookie can get. I had no idea what I was doing. But I did want to follow him, and I was learning along the way, and I remember one Sunday, it was a small church here in the city of Birmingham, and um, a man came into our church that day, and man, did he look impressive. The whole suit thing, he had his beard just right and neat and everything. He looked like a professor off the biggest campus on earth. He was impressive as can be. He stood there so majestically. He carried with him a Bible. He just looked excellent. And uh, as soon as I finished preaching, people were coming up to me already and saying, Hey, did you see that guy? Whoa, we got to get him. We want him. And uh, I said, well, I'll, I'll go and talk to him. And I went over and I, I started talking to him. And he said, boy, I appreciate your message so much. He said, how about if we get together for dinner this week? I said, well, okay, we could do that. So we set a place, and I went over to the, the restaurant where he was, and uh, he came in, and he sat down, but he wasn't alone. He had somebody else with him. And they started to talk to me. They started to talk to me about things, about God's Word and stuff like that. And at first I'm thinking, yeah, okay, okay, that's pretty cool, this is cool. And then eventually started to get like, huh? What? And I started to hear things that I'd never seen in God's Word, never heard in God's Word. And that little bell on the inside starts ringing, and the flashing lights start going off. And I said, something is wrong here. I mean, I don't have to know what's bad in the refrigerator to smell it. And so I said, oh, this, this, this isn't, something's not right here. And I didn't know what it was. And we finished our lunch, and, and he agreed, I agreed. We'd meet again another time. I wanted to talk to him some more, and I wanted to figure this out. I went home, went to my office, pulled out my uh, uh, Martin's Kingdom of the Colts, and I start page one. Zoom, 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 zoom. You go a long way till you get to Armstrongism. And there it was, every word, every word, every verse, everything he was using was all over that page. Folks, that is an ugly, ugly cult. And I started to scour that and read it and go into the passages that contended against it and learned and learned and learned. And I went back to that next meal with him. And he had his guru with him. And they had every intention of changing the heart of a pastor. And they started in on their talk, and I would start flipping the pages to the scripture. And I'd come to the passage, and I'd say, yeah, but this is what God said. And I'd read it to them. And they'd move on to the next point, and they'd start talking about this, and then I'd start flipping to the next passage. I was scared to pieces, folks. But I kept going back to the Word, back to the Word. It was halfway through that the guru was thumping the cover of his Bible. He says, that's not what it says. That's not what it says. And I was reading. He wasn't. And then finally, he got up and walked out of the room. And the other guy was sitting there, and he looked at me and said, that was it. He got up and he left too. Never saw him again. You know what I felt? Exhausted. <laughs> but even on top of that, I felt relieved. 
I had just spared my congregation from something terrible. I didn't know exactly what I was doing, but I knew there was a wolf there, and he had come to devour. And that was something that taught me very early in my ministry how important it was for me to lead my people carefully. I had to be careful. I had to train them because the average person looks on the outward appearance of a man and they say, that's the one for us. And they forget to look at their heart. They forget to look at what they say and what they believe. So first thing, we ought to know what they look like. The second thing is we ought to know their end. In your contemplating, in your thinking through, and you're bewaring and looking intently and understanding them. Far too often our, our congregations in our world are scared by the loud bark of the dog, <coughs> by the threatening show of teeth, by the bristling hair, because intimidation is one of their best weapons. Peter talks about the lion being our enemy in 1 Peter 5, and they go about roaring, and that will stop you in your tracks especially if it's three feet behind you. That says, you're my breakfast guy. The roaring is paralyzing, and they make a lot of noise. But it's very good to know, if you study God's word carefully, you get to know their end. You get to know that they do not win. And that's important for us to know. To realize that the shepherd is the protector of the flock, that he will bring his people home, is our comfort. That's why we move closer to him. More Christ. More Christ. Jesus said he will build his church. And what's the second half of that phrase? And the gates of hell will now prevail against it. Do you think he was kidding? He's absolutely sure of it because he knows his church. We know that the warning is not just a glance. Beware. Okay, let's move on. It's not a glance. Keep on bewaring is necessary. If you seek to know more Christ, understand that the enemy wants you to have less Christ. That's their goal. To separate you from your shepherd. The commentators, when you read about them, they call these guys the Judaizers. All right? They, they teach a, a doctrine of justification by works. And they go in and, and they spread this teaching among the Gentiles because the Gentiles didn't know. The proselytes, they didn't know. And so they say, oh, you've got to be subject to the Mosaic Law. You have to, before you become a Christian, you've got to be circumcised. You've got to go through all these things. And yet we know that salvation is through Jesus Christ alone. We know what Scripture says. Even Paul wrote this, right? For by grace are you saved through faith. And that's not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And I show you the history section of the book of Acts. Wherever Paul went, the Judaizers went too. They followed him everywhere to counter the gospel message, to impose upon the people a system of works for salvation. Paul called them dogs. Dogs. Not a poodle, not a German shepherd. They were like a pack of filthy animals that roamed the street. They ate garbage and they terrorized people. To use the term was not a compliment, by the way. You don't say, boy, you're a great dog. <laughs> That's not a compliment. There's nothing endearing in the term dogs to the Christian church. Dogs were not domesticated. They were not being taken to England for the Westminster Kennel Club show. There are about 23 verses in the Bible that refers to dogs, and none of them speak of them as a pet. But there are filthy beasts that eat dead animals and dead people. Jezebel, come to mind. That's such a horrible passage to read. Ah. Dogs brought fear. I won't belabor the point, but it's clear to see they're dangerous. And that's why he brings it up here. Because they can easily divert your eyes from the shepherd. 
you want a good picture of this, take a group of children out and want to lead them from here to the cabins over there, and then put a big pack of dogs right up there, and guess what they're looking at the whole way? They're not looking at the person leading them. You could be 14 feet, even 140 feet in front of them, and they forgot about you. <laughs> it's up there. That's what their eyes are set on. And you're saying, but Paul, you're telling us to keep our eyes on them. The squinty eye. Keep your eye on these guys. They're dangerous. But stay close to your shepherd. Stay close as you walk. Don't lose eye of, of where, you're, where you are in more of Christ. But keep an eye out there, too. There are dogs that want to destroy you. There's evil workers out there. That's the second group he said, beware of. Evil workers. He said, oh, these are bad people. I mean, that guy comes in here and stirs salt into the pudding. Isn't that evil? Oh, that's terrible. No, it's not that kind of evil. Kikos is a Greek word. It means worthless. Let me give you the picture here. They may look as busy as bees in their working, but they have no resulted value. They can easily convince us to work with them because of their efforts and all their time and all their expenses that they put into it, but they have no worth. No worth. I would hate to live a whole life busy in the Lord's business to find out it wasn't for Him at all. There are things that the Lord are going to test in the end, remember? He's going to test our works. You know that Corinthians passage? Ever scare you? Read through that and say, oh, I don't know what that's going to be like. The works that I've done, he's going to test them to see if they're good or if they are worthless. That's Picasso again. Worthless. Let me tell you what the test looks like. From best I understand it, I think this is the answer. Whatever is done according to his will, whatever is done according to his direction, whatever is done according to his strength, Whatever is done according to his attitude, whatever is done according to his glory, will pass the test. Anytime man is inserted in there, I don't think it's going to last the fire. If we do things by our will, by our direction, by our wisdom, by our strength, by our power, by our attitude, by our glory, I think it's going to burn up. It doesn't matter how good it is. Anything we do with the wrong attitude... Really? Have this mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus? That's more of Christ. How easy it is, and I know it, folks, I've been in camps before, how easy it is to do all the right things with the wrong attitude. Those kind of things, don't, they're, they're all about our glory. They're not about His glory. But I don't think they're going to pass the test. How much work is wasted if we don't do it correctly? That's what we're supposed to be bewaring of. Bewaring of those who have worthlessness in their work. They are there, but they're doing it of their own will, of their own strength, for their own glory. They're working hard, all their work harder than anybody else. Don't think of a, a false teacher as somebody who's lazy. I mean, they have something they want to do. They want to impress people with their wisdom. They want to impress people with their strategies and their plans and their talking. They want to impress them with their ability to communicate. They want to impress them with all these things. Ask the Corinthians. They were easily impressed by these kind of people. And that's the scary thing is that we're attracted to it. We say, ooh, this guy speaks good. He must be good. This guy does a lot of work. He must be great. This guy, oh, he's just into everything. He must be God's worker. And yet, he could be doing it all for his own glory. Beware. Because that will suck us into it, too. And we'll become part of their team, and we'll work together with them. And we'll be wasting a lot of time because we're not doing it God's way. That's a tough one. That's why you have to watch that with a squinty eye, too. You've got to evaluate what's going on. I don't want to be a worthless worker, do you? I don't want my, my works when I'm all done and said to see it go up in smoke. 
because I've done it my way, with my own ambitions, with my own desires, with my, that's worthless, folks. Beware of them, beware of them. Oh, they slip in so quickly. Don't become like them. You will if you're not close to Christ. Because the closer you get to Christ, the more you start to think like he does. You start to realize your strength is his strength. And you go to chapter 4 and you realize, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that becomes your power. And his words are your words. And his attitude is your attitude. That's more Christ. That avoids this problem. Paul warns the Philippians, you can't be focused on more Christ when your work becomes more you. That's one of the enemies to the church. It's sneaky. But it works its way in there. And I'd hate to give more to myself and less to Christ. The third description, real simple, the circumcision. Paul uses that again in verse number three, by the way. You'll see it, we're of the true circumcision, if your text has that extra word in there. Uh, but what's interesting is there's two different words between verse two and verse number three. The word for circumcision translated in two is different than the one in verse three. Verse three speaks of the true circumcision that was told, talked to them, and how they ought to do it, and such like that. The one in verse number two is the opposite form of it, it's not to build up at all, it's to cut down. It's literally two words, cut down. It's negative in its concept. Some translations call it mutilation. Mutilation. I could love telling the story. I, I did this in one of our little churches up in Indiana. My son was only about uh, three years old at the time. And uh, we were in this beautiful little church with a beautiful little parsonage right next door, not within 15, 30 feet or so of the church building. And uh, the landscaping was gorgeous all the way around the church. Uh, one of the ladies, it was her mother's estate that went into building the beautiful landscape all around the church. And you go up to the front door of the church and there's beautiful, beautiful matching trees on either side. And my son was missing for about 20 minutes. <laughs> And I came out around the corner to look for him, and there he was with one of the trees chopped down, and he was dancing on it. Ah! You know that feeling? What do you do? He just tore the tree down. He had an axe in his hand. He chopped it down. It was a stub this tall. The other one's five feet tall. What do you do? You know, you can't replace that easily. I, I called the lady, I said, oh, I'm very sorry. I have to tell you what just happened. I don't know what she said when I hung up, but she came over and I said, I'll replace it. I'll go get another one. I bought another tree. Same time, it was shorter. Do you know that shorter trees don't make up for distance? When that other one grew up real tall, this one always grew up a little shorter. And forever, you saw the difference because one little mutilation took place many years ago. Here's an interesting picture. I don't know why I always think that, but it's there in my head. You know how parents are. Here's one who chops down, chops down, chops away, chops away, chops away. They think the more they do it, the more they gain merit with God. You want this picture? It's really interesting because they think God loves it more and more the more they torture themselves. They have the wrong view of God, by the way. But on top of that, they set a terrible example for other people. Because here are the guys who are really dedicated. They're going to mutilate because they want everyone to think that they're highly consecrated to God, highly devoted to God, and they don't care what happens to them. They're just going to impress him. Why did God say don't do it in the Old Testament? He said in Leviticus 21 verse 5, You should not make baldness on thy head. Neither shall they shave off the corner of their beard, nor make any cutting in their flesh. And I think of that, and then I think of Elijah. Remember the prophets of Baal? They had that contest going on, and the prophets were trying to get Baal's attention. And how did they do that? They pulled out their swords and their knives and started chopping themselves up. And they were gashed, and they were bleeding, 
And Elijah had a lot of fun with that. He says, hey, you're God. He's a God, right? He, he must be talking to somebody. You're not doing good. Get his attention. He's out there talking to somebody. He's on a journey. Maybe he's asleep. Yell louder, cut deeper. And so he's encouraging them to continue on. And they kept cutting, 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 cutting themselves till the blood gushed out of them. You ever wonder how he was able to kill 450 prophets? They couldn't move. <laughs> but that was a picture. That what a sad religion it is, folks. Aren't you glad the Lord doesn't call Christians to do that today? Man, this camp would be a mess. We're all out here cutting ourselves up and stuff like that. But Paul says, Philippians, Philippians, watch for these guys. Not only do they insert works into their religion, but they, in this senseless, over-the-top ritualism, think that their intense devotion is somehow looks more spiritual and more pleasing to God. And they are a danger to the flock. That's why it says, beware. Beware of these. Because what they're doing in all their effects has no worth in God's eyes. No worth at all. If these things could pull you closer to God, do you think Paul would have said, try it? If these things were what God had told him to tell the people, it would have been all over the pages of his writing. Instead, he said, these things are dung. They go in the column of that which is a detriment to your desire to be like Christ. Christ didn't call you to chop yourself up. Christ didn't call you to work like a dog for no reason, for no purpose, for yourself. God, he didn't call you to that. Christ didn't call you to be chewed up by the dogs, to fall for their religion, to fall for their teaching, to fall for their, uh, their loyal, to, the, to be loyal to them. Christ says, follow me. Follow me. Stay close to me. That's why the emphasis all the way through here, and now I say, it fits the context very well. If we're talking about being more like Christ, more Christ, notice there are those who want to stop you. They want to prevent you. They don't want you to be more like Christ. And they're going to do everything they can in their efforts, in their intensity, in their loudness, in their intimidation. They're going to try everything in the book to keep you from focusing on Jesus. Boy, do we need prayer, don't we? Yes, we do. I keep encouraging you now. Keep on doing it. Uh, follow Christ, uh, Paul's example. More, more Christ. And while you're doing it, beware of the dangers out there. They want to stop you. Heavenly Father, help us. Oh, help us with this. There are many dangers in our land. Some that are easy to spot and some that are so, so difficult to see. Teach us how to evaluate that which lasts, that which is good. Mostly, Lord, I think we just need to know you better and your word better so that we can easily see the contrast between what is of Christ and what is not. Teach us, Lord. Teach us to draw closer to you in the days of danger. We get paralyzed by our fears. We, we decide we can't go down that road because of the, the potential of dangers when our shepherd says go. And we're afraid. So many times, Lord, we, we are limited in ministry because we don't beware of the dogs or the evil workers or the mutilators who are out there who are tearing up ministries left and right. We're not being careful, Lord. Teach us what this is all about and help us to remain in that. Keep on, keep on bewaring. And more than that, help us to teach our children. They're going to see it probably more than we will. Help us to teach our grandchildren because those are the generations that will follow and the evil workers and the false teachers do not go away. Unfortunately, from what we read in Scripture, it gets worse. So Lord, train us well that we might train others to keep their eyes on the enemies as we follow our Savior. Teach us to be more like Christ, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.